Uh, I think we are. Uh, we need to start. Welcome everybody. Uh, on behalf of MSP IRIA and uh, Maharashtra College of Radiology, I welcome Professor Dr. Ravi Ramakantan, a uh, well-known radiologist, a teacher par excellence, and a great human being. He has been very helpful to allowing us and rope in him for this series of radiology lectures. Sir is a very a busy person still he has taken time out from his schedule and help, trying to help us as much as he can it's up to us to learn whatever he has to teach us on in his third lecture two were earlier on chest radiography and now third on the bone tumors so i welcome dr and professor dr ravi ramakantan sir in this webinar and uh, request him to start his webinar over to you sir thank you very much <clears throat> okay, so I mean, let's start. Uh, we are ahead of time. We are announcing ahead of what is that? Ahead of time landing. What? Okay. Um, so this bone tumor is uh, a topic which most of you are not concerned with on a day-to-day -day basis, unless you are perhaps in an institution. And even in an institution, uh, unless you have an orthopedic surgeon uh, or a neurosurgeon, sometimes interested in bone tumors, you see these cases very rarely. Uh, so there are two aspects to this. One, if you see them, it's so interesting. One day, a few years back, I got a call, a uh, phone call from one of my former residents. And he said, sir, uh, I see a bone tumor at the lower end of the tibia. What should I write? I see a bone tumor at the lower end of the tibia. What should I write? So he used, he stays near uh, uh, Hawaii Lake. I said, go to the lake and jump. He was a student of mine, and I apparently had taught him so much on bone tumor. It's my favorite topic. And he simply said, this is a, a tumor, what should I write? So that's one. You forget everything if you don't see uh, cases on, off and on. So that you've got two options when you see something like that. The more intelligent, the, the average person will say, there is a bone tumor, report is over. That's all call up the neuro uh, orthopedic surgeon. The smart ones will say, X-ray is done as required. There is no report. X-ray is done as required. So very often we do that in orthopedic uh, practice and there is hardware or whatever. So that's not the way it should be. Okay. I'll tell you why it should not be that way. There are two or three uh, ever so often, you know, orthopedic surgeons don't even look at the X, uh, look at our reports. That's 95% of the time. They are being very generous. 5% will tear the report in front of the patient and throw it into a paper basket. So there are a few instances where nobody else, I mean, no other specialty person will understand about bone tumors as much as a good radiologist will. What do I mean a good radiologist? A radiologist who is oriented towards bone tumors, that's all. So unless you have somebody who is an orthopedic oncologist or oncosurgeon, uh, you do not expect an average pediatrician, an average physician or a surgeon, I mean, it, it's stupid, physician or surgeon, a physician, a surgeon is also a physician. Okay, a non-surgeon and a surgeon, uh, endocrinologist, across the board, very few people really understand bone tumors. So, um, so when you see a bone tumor, you should be able to make sense of it in your report. And you'll say, I say once in 10 years, how am I supposed to remember? Which is what I'm going to show now, that you don't have to see bone tumors every other day to be able to make a simple report. It's extremely simple. One of the most easy things in all of radiology. And as you go, as I go through my lecture, you'll realize that it's indeed really easy. And this is not easy for the purposes of my lecture. It is really, really easy to tell few things about the bone tumors, which can help further management. Um, the only time a pathologist walks into my room or has been walking into my room for the last 40 years is when she gets a specimen of a bone tumor, right? Uh, so it's either a core biopsy nowadays or previously it used to be an open biopsy or whatever, whatever. And the question they ask very simply, and you won't believe it, is this an osteogenic sarcoma? You look at the X-ray and you say, for God's sake, this is callus formation. Don't blame the pathologist. They have big problems in telling, making a proper diagnosis of bone tumors off and on. 
uh, I have a few pathology friends who regularly send me x-rays on, on email and say, what do you think, what do you think? The reason that happens is not because pathologists are incompetent. These are seasoned, experienced bone pathologists because they are given a small chunk of the tree and somebody is asking them, what tree is this? Don't blame them. Sometimes they can and sometimes they can't. So this is one area where uh, you will have a pathologist asking the radiologist, tell me the diagnosis. The question is, is this possible? There is a small twist to that story. Unlike in so many other areas of radiology, one most important thing about bone tumors, whether this is a benign tumor or a malignant tumor, that differentiation is best made on plain foam. I repeat, on plain foam in 2020. Neither MR nor CT can answer that as well as plain foam. I mean, they can do it many times, but plain foams can do it more often. So whether you are practicing conventional radiology or not, I tell this again and again. In our country, we are modality based and it's, it's immensely un, un, unfair to the patient. In any case, so if, whether you practice bone from plain films or not, I walk you through this lecture for the like next 45 minutes. At the end of it, you will realize it's extremely easy. I repeat, it's extremely easy in majority of the times to tell whether you have a tumor or not, and whether it's a benign tumor or a malignant tumor. That's all we need to say. The rest of it will be worked out by, by somebody else. Now, what do I mean by somebody else? So the first thing, as far as bone tumors are concerned, is to make a diagnosis. Bone tumor, what tumor? That most of the time is made well on plain films. I repeat, on plain films alone in this 2020. So you need to know a little bit about plain films. And if you are doing MR and CT of bone tumors, cross-sectional imaging, please do not report that without having a look at plain film. You will look stupid off and on. So you have to have knowledge of plain films uh, to be able to make sensible reports of bone tumor, no matter what you do. So there are two parts, as I said. The first part is to make a diagnosis. Now, as I walk you, walk you through the uh, lecture, I want you to put yourself in the position of a relative of a patient, the father, the mother, son or a daughter of a patient. And then you realize that what are the steps that you should go through when you want to make a diagnosis. So the first thing is about making a diagnosis of if this is a tumor or not, and whether it's a benign tumor or a malignant tumor. These are the main two arms of learning that I want you to have from this 45 minutes. The rest of it is somebody else can do it. It's not a big deal. And this part I'm repeating for the fourth time is not difficult if you apply your mind to it. So if you have a closed mind, it's so difficult. I don't know anything you'll not learn. On the other hand, if you follow uh, the follow the steps that I'm going through, you'll realize that it is easy. It is really easy. So the diagnosis first thing depends on plain films. On the other hand, there's a huge aspect of bone tumors that many radiologists don't uh, understand and they harm patients when they don't understand the other part. Before, <laughs> before a bone tumor can be managed, most of the time by surgery, sometimes by both of them, surgery, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, sometimes no surgery, you have to have CT and or MR. It's absolutely essential. Nobody touches bone tumors these days. Nobody should be touching bone tumors without CT, MR, and of course, PET wherever, wherever indicated, which is now most of the time. Now, when you work with CT and MR, it's extremely important to speak the language of the orthopedic surgeon. In fact, the orthopedic surgeon. if you want, they are specialized people. Uh, they need certain information uh, before they can operate. And more than that, if you are going to do a biopsy of a bone tumor, God's sake, do not puncture, take a biopsy from wherever you want. It's extremely important that you understand that you cannot biopsy a bone tumor like you biopsy a kidney or the liver or the lung. You cannot do that. You have to know what the orthopedic surgeon is going to do for that patient, where his incision is going to be. So you have to have close understanding or in-depth understanding 
of the surgery part of it before you can biopsy or this. Now, I'm not talking about CT and MR on PET for two reasons. Not because I don't have time, because I don't know enough to be able to give a lecture. Uh, I'll mention by name one person who in intensely understands that at least in the city of Bombay is Bhavin Jankarya. I mentioned Bhavin for over 25 years. He has been having meetings with orthopedic oncologists and discussing every single case on management. So he has a sense of feeling for these bone tumors. So you don't have to have that kind of thing. All that you need to know is that you can't just report bone tumor pathology on CT and MR without understanding a little bit about management and having dialogue with the orthopedic surgeon. So any of you out there doing a lot of CT and MR of bone tumors, please have close interaction with the orthopedic surgeons and then start reporting. You will see that your quality of reports uh, skyrockets from that time. You will make sense to the orthopedic surgeon. There is no shame in telling the orthopedic surgeon, please teach me what you want to know from my MR on CT. It's never shame. What is shameful is not knowing that you don't know. So if you are in a category where you are reporting Namke Vastre, CT and MR, the patients pay a lot of money for that. They are anxious, they are sick, and they expect reasonable reports. And it doesn't look good at all. And it's not un it's unfair if the orthopedic surgeon tears the report and throws it out in the bin in front of them. It need not happen. So I, I have this earnest request. Cross-sectional imaging fellows, if you're not already done so, meet with the orthopedic oncologist and learn from them how the reporting is to be done and what is it that they're looking for, what claim they are looking for, vessel. Now we report, go to town about vessel. They say, we don't care. We will see the vessel. We will separate it. And we go to the, the three millimeters, four millimeters. It doesn't make sense to them. So this is two parts of it. So one is plain foam, uh, which is this lecture about is making a diagnosis and management is about cross-sectional imaging. Okay, the first thing, and this is an important part of it, okay, because nobody like a radiologist can tell the answer this question. And this happens not infrequently. Now, it, not infrequently is a very nice word to use. It's a typical radiology word. Not infrequently does not mean frequently. When you don't know what to say, you say not infrequently. Okay, so it happens off and on that somebody sees a lesion like this. And this is typical, okay? Absolutely typical. A well-defined osteolytic lesion about a centimeter in diameter in the in the region of the greater tuberosity before you know an MR is done, before you know a set a set is done, before you know a PET scan is done, the patient has had a fall on the shoulder and he complains of pain and this X-ray has been done to rule out a fracture. People go to town on a non-lesion. This is a variant. Okay, there's no such thing as normal variant. A variant is normal. Okay. So this is a variant. Uh, at this point, I should uh, mention uh, Clyde Helms' book, okay? C-L-Y-D-E-H-E-L-M-S. So he has a small book, which is available in paperback. I think it's for 3,000 rupees. I am pitching in for it because I get a 10% discount on uh, uh, commission on everything that's sold from Amazon. I'm not kidding. Buy that book. It doesn't matter what you do in life. If you report even a single skeletal x-ray, you should read Climb Chair's book. You can finish that book in two hours on a flight from Chennai, Delhi, wherever to Bombay, whenever those flights resume. It's fun. That book is full of humor, it's full of wisdom, and it's full of learning. Fundamentals of Skeletal Radiology by Clyde Helms. It should be compulsory reading for all radiologists, especially if you're a resident, buy that book and read that book. So he called this lesion, I'll come down to the in a minute. So this is one lesion. Unless you are an orthopedic oncologist who has learned by fire, okay? You're done dumping something, you go and do there's nothing but normal both. Most others will call this an osteolytic lesion, okay? This is one area. The other area which is commonly known is this one. Oval osteolytic lesion in the proximal end of the radius in the region of the radial, uh, radial tuberosity. This is the so called on end appearance of the radial tuberosity, which is mainly callus. I'm sorry, cancel as both. So, this one that you see there, oval proximal end of the radius in the region of the radial tuberosity, is normal osteolysis. Okay. 
and sometimes this is you know there's an old say a black cat comes twice this is on the opposite side of the shoulder this looks more suspicious uh, one other example that i don't have is in the calcaneum calcaneum in the uh, in the body of the calcaneum uh, near the angle near the region of the bolus angle you often get no bone no trabecular pattern at all especially on ct scans it's black and we tend to call it bone tumor so uh, so these are examples of the first question now as you go through as i go through my lecture i often say in last lecture that i am god i am speaking you follow what i say what i mean is that these have been helpful to me for a period of so many years in making reasonable diagnosis of bone tumors 80 90% of the time there are difficult ones and i stumble and stumble badly but 80 90% of the time i am right this works it really works in real life so is the capital is because of the first thing is there a lesion okay incidental finding and then you call it a bone tumor as i told you so this is these are some examples these are classical example that keep happening off and on okay not infrequently now in all of radiology world's greatest great consultant to radiologists as mentioned the last time this is felsen's word wgc the world's greatest consultant to radiologists is patient's previous image whenever you don't know what's going on or even when you know what's going on it's important to ask the patient whether there are previous imaging studies unless you are making open and shut diagnosis it's always a good idea to ask the patient if there are old x rays okay old mr old whatever and go through them seriously in fact that's a that the first question a patient comes to you for an opinion referred from somebody i don't even talk to him without asking previous imaging studies okay they may have they may not have and if they have and they are not got i insist that they get i burned my fingers so often that i have only three fingers left now okay so it's extremely important to have this as a habit it should come as a habit like like you say frontal radiograph a uh, plain and contrast mr scan first sentence this should be the first sentence when you are reporting any bone lesion or any lesion whatever I mean it's not possible to do it every time what i'm trying to say is the sense of importance of this one question was there a lesion now <clears throat> this again is what something i told you last time about okay uh, i call this akash fallacy that means what you see something you get carried away and you say that okay this lesion this lesion every single time in bone tumors when you are looking at something you have to ask yourself is there any other lesion which means you close your eyes cover the damn lesion i mean i mean really cover that lesion in the proximal end of the femur and keep looking at the rest of the bone it's a habit you have to develop in your resident now these are things that i say not for the sake of lecture these are real life lessons that i have learned okay sometimes i don't follow them and i get into trouble i make mistakes so this is the other thing that you should ask every single time when you are reporting bone tumors so is there a lesion was there a lesion is this the only lesion now <clears throat> this is what i said sir initially. sir can i interrupt you sir can i interrupt yeah. you sorry uh, uh, i think many people are not able to see your screen so you need to just uh, switch share. off your screen share once and then restart your screen share if it is possible sir i think so it's possible what are the point in talking with people can't i stop re sharing uh, yeah and now you restart the share Okay, this one right. Turn screen share on. Yeah. This is the window. Which is the window now? Wait a minute. Uh, yeah, PowerPoint. Yeah, this window. Yeah. Now what? Now your whole screen is coming up, sir. Yeah. So I'll do yeah. this. Yeah, and maximize it, sir. Uh, Okay, now I did some Gucci. Okay, this yeah. one is okay. Important. Fine. Yeah, right. So, okay. thank you, sir. You can see. People can see any feedback. Samir, can you hear me? I can hear you very well, sir. Okay, so this is one classic example, right? You look at this femur, and you are excited. 
because you have made the diagnosis. You see these protuberances uh, in the proximal end of the femur, in the distal end of the femur, and you call it osteochondromas, right? But the back of your mind, you're sure that when you see multiple osteochondromas, you're looking at diaphyseal ecclesia. That this one x-ray is classical of diaphyseal ecclesia is beside the point. You have to always remember, not just osteochondromas, it can be any lesion, may be multiple, may be multiple, not commonly, not infrequently, but off and on. So this is protocol, right? Protocol driven thing. Early morning you get up and generally most of us brush our teeth. So this is like that. You look at this lesion, the first thing that comes to your mind is I want to look at the other lesions. Now the patient is sitting in front of you because he's come for the report. Now, as a radiologist, we always think other lesions mean PET scan. For God's sake, use your brains. The patient is sitting in front of you, ask him this question, do you have any other problem? Do you have previous imaging studies? Are there any other abnormalities? In lesions like this, for example, multiple osteochondromas, the patient will give you the diagnosis. He will say that I'm a known case of multiple osteochondroma. Some of them even say diaphyseal ecclesia. So talking to the patient is extremely useful when you want to know if there are other lesions. Kidar kidar dukta hai, or kidar dukta hai, the patient will point to the back. A region where very difficult to image on plain films, right? So this is extremely important. Talking to patient is always useful in radiology and especially when you want to know if there are multiple bone tumors and they will tell you where the pain is and that makes life so much easier. So this is the part of, is this an only lesion and this patient had a long length view of x-rays and there are so many other lesions. The bones are dysplastic. So this is the official ecclesia. So this is just one obvious example. But no matter what that lesion is, it's a good idea to ask yourself if there are more lesions in the film that you have. You don't have to go to town and do a skeletal survey or PET scan uh, all the time. Uh, this is a word that I bo borrowed from Clyde Hayes. Okay, he has this beautiful phrase there, touch me not lesions, right? Uh, sometimes surgeons are trigger happy. You see something, it needs fixing. For God's sake, it does not need fixing because it doesn't do anything. And this is a classic example, as classic as you can get of a fibrous dysplasia. This has been with the patient for a long time. It will go with the patient and die with the patient and do nothing. It's important therefore not to touch this lesion and to be confidently making a diagnosis that this is in the cortex, it is well defined, it may be slightly expansive and the patient has come for something, something and this x-ray is done and you call this touch me not lesion and call it fibrous cortical defect, okay? And if the orthopedic surgeon asks you what should be done, you can don't touch. If the patient comes with a fracture, that fracture heals well here. So you don't know to, and of course the lesion heats, the fracture heats. So these are from, borrowed from client Hems, touch me not lesion. He has so many of those touch me not lesion. So, so we call them as incidental findings, okay? Sometimes I wrote incidental finding of no clinical significance. Okay, the orthopedic surgeon will say, how do you know no clinical significance? Can I say, I see the gray hair? I'm telling you, this is of no clinical significance. Do not fool around with that. I mean, when you get it by my age, you can do all that, but when you're younger, you have to be more polite and say that I feel that it is a benign lesion, need not be touched. So, so we have these two queries, right? Is there a lesion? And the next thing is, if there is a lesion, is it a neoplasm? Okay, put yourself in the position of a patient. Patient's mother, patient's father, son, daughter. If there is something and the GPS at my X-ray may kuch hai, patient is scared and he wants to know if there is cancer. They don't say if there is a tumor. They often say, is there a cancer? So that is one important question that you should be able to answer on a, radio, on a radiograph. By and large, one look at the patient, a little bit of examination, you can tell that whether this is a neoplasm or this is infection. It's not a big deal. I'm saying this because sometimes it's a big deal. Ewing sarcoma is one example. So how do you tell a neoplasm from infection? Now, most times it's easy, right? Uh, one, look at the patient and look at the radiograph. This is what the whole thing is. The first point, infection or neoplasm. Now, it's like magic. Tumors, no matter how aggressive they are, I think I jumped one slide. Let me do this. Yeah, tumors, no matter how aggressive they are, do not cross joints, okay? 
look at this fellow okay he is broader than tall he goes all over the place he has produced scalloping of the adjacent proximal uh, phalanx of the ring finger but in spite of growing from side to side he comes up to the articular surface and stops it's like magic right the articular cartilage for reason that i don't understand if you understand let me understand offers phenomenal resistance to spread of tumor okay? and then most tumors most tumors will stop at the articular cartilage and of course like everything in life there are exceptions the one exception to this rule are unusual bone cysts they cross joints the other uh, exception is giant cell tumor now giant cell tumors can occur on both sides of the joint in reality they don't join they cross the joint they can occur at the lower end of the femur and upper on the tibia and look like they are crossing joints but they don't cross joints the only tumor that i know of that routinely i'm not saying routinely most frequently of all tumors benign tumors crosses the joints in fact of all tumors benign or malignant that crosses the joint is an unusual bone cyst most often in the spine and often mistaken for tuberculous spine so this is the first if you see a lesion coming close to the articular cartilage the damn thing is in the diaphysal you can't help it right but it comes to you close to the articular surface and does not cross the articular surface it is not an infection because infection this is what an infection does where it happened yeah um a lesion like this is open and shut infection that means it's uh, affected the femoral head or is it the capital epiphysis whatever it has affected the acetabulum it has produced joint swelling it produced deformity sclerosis all masala and this is infection so this is classical infection i'm showing classic slides because it's important to keep this in mind anything that crosses the joint for all practical purposes in one slide time unless you do 10 lives you're not coming going to come across an unusual bone cyst that crosses this spaces or articular surface so it's that uncommon so for all practical purposes this is tumor and this is infection that's a very useful rule um the second thing second step so first you are ruled out whether this is infection or tumor is much more easy on examining patient than breaking a head with plain films or mr or ct and mr ct can be very bad have you ever seen a mr of a boil on the skin do that and see fun okay <clears throat> you get all sorts of diagnosis you do contrast more fun uh age of the patient so there is nothing more important in clinical finding and the age of the patient to give a histological diagnosis of bone tumor they occur in patterns some things never occur before epiphyseal fusion what do i mean by age i do not mean uh 57 years versus 42 years i do not mean 13 years versus 15 years there is one broad category but there are some tumors that occur in particular age group you in sarcoma magic number 5 to 15 years i will never forget it rarely happens later it rarely happens before but the magic number for ewing sarcoma is 5 to 15 years of age but that's that's beside the point that he is an outlier the basic question that you have to answer is is this a mature skeleton that means the epiphyses are fused or is this an immature skeleton the epiphyses are open so one of the first things i tell my resident i make them repeat this day after day okay and if they miss one step i tell them go back start over over again so if they say this is a, of a, of the radial whatever whatever and the first sentence the first line should be shall be that's legal okay shall be the age of the patient where you say most time you will be able to say mature skeleton or immature skeleton it's that important what i'm saying is that age helps you make a histological diagnosis on plain films more than many other things okay so this is mature versus immature skeleton i should have put a one in front of it this is the first thing so you don't jump to radiology you look at the maturity of the skeleton now this is one tumor on your left this is mature skeleton when you see a lesion like this i can close my eyes and say that this is a particular tumor i don't care what the pathologist says sometimes they goof up and it's not their fault i explained to you this is just one lesion almost always okay this is another lesion in a way they look similar right in a sense but the one on your right is immature skeleton the one on your left is a mature skeleton 
this can never be the one on your left can almost never be an unusual bone cyst in fact it can never be an unusual most cyst the one on your right can never be a giant cell tumor it's that easy okay this is like mathematics there are almost no exceptions i mean there are exceptions occasionally you never know who is right now pathology is very sure this is this is a malignant tumor and you are very sure that this is a benign tumor okay whatever so most times you will be able to say that this is a particular tumor and this is another tumor this cannot be that and that cannot be this okay it is so useful so the first step you would say for example films on the lower end of the radius of an immature skeleton first first very first okay now the next important question and the patient knows his age you don't want to tell him how old are you for god's sake that that not the first thing that the patient is concerned about the patient is concerned about is this cancer right now you have to be very careful when they ask cancer they don't understand the word tumor different from cancer tumor for them is cancer so be careful when you talk to them uh so the question that the patient suppose he you say that you have cancer you say that there is a tumor you know whatever so he wants to know doctor there is a tumor is this cancer then he understand that this is malignant etc etc okay it's very complex different patients from different backgrounds or different understanding of the word tumor so benign or malignant and this is where plain films come in they can make this differentiation better than ct or mr in so many different so many uh, patients a vast majority of patients plain films are right i'm not saying mr and ct are wrong but plain films life is easier and more accurate than mr or ct <coughs> in telling whether it's a benign tumor or a malignant tumor that's the first thing okay now how do you do that and it's simple there is a word called zone of transition so when i tell my bachu log to talk they will say this is the result of a mature skeleton that shows a lesion so many centimeters in diameter in this region and then they talk about zone of transition okay i don't want to say well defined now well defined is like uh, like a layman talking well defined you have to use the word you have to use the word you have to use the word zone of transition the zone of transition is the region between the outermost part don't go inside the politics of the tumor right it can do whatever it wants inside you go to the outermost part of the tumor you go to the nearest part of the normal bone and look at that area whether it is narrow or well defined or sharp and you say it's so subjective how can we be sure i have shown this or similar x-rays for 40 years and i asked for a show of hands how many of you think this is a wide zone of transition i have never had one hand go up and say that this is wide zone of transition what's that 5000 people 10000 people okay no one ever calls this as wide zone of transition so if you have a doubt in your mind that telling plain for on plain from narrow zone of transition from wide zone of transition perish that thought most times after there are exception most time it's possible to tell wide zone of transition from narrow zone of transition and this one is a narrow zone of transition uh for all practical purposes I mean for all real life purposes this is a benign tumor and that's the twist to the tale here okay uh some radiologists like to use the word rather than benign when the zone of transition is sharp or well defined they use the word non aggressive tumor don't get into that if you if you're not a, a big time bone radiologist for tumors it's safe to call it benign tumor though it is uh, academically pedantically wrong to say bone a uh, benign every single time or safer to say non aggressive for all practical purposes zone of transition well defined sharp is a benign lesion okay you want to sound very uh, learned say non aggressive lesion okay this one again you go to the periphery of the lesion towards the proximal end of the radius you see normal bone i should hide this thing right being very dubbish oh uh, and you see this area i hope you can see the pointer here you see this area it's sharp well defined ask anybody on the road okay anybody on the road and give this two options is it well defined or poorly defined if they understand english they will say this is well defined that simple most of the time exceptions for the time being you can forget okay look at this fellow okay from churchgate up to vira this guy is going all over the place 
Now, it's interesting. It's, it probably is right for you to say that this is a wide zone of transition. Uh, but in a technical manner, you might be wrong. In fact, in, in this case, you can never be wrong. But the point I want to make here is that you can never be legally right in saying that I'm just having fun, legally right, because you cannot say any normal bone. So zone of transition is between normal bone and abnormal bone. No matter how malignant the inside of the bone looks like, unless you can see the zone of transition, by its very name, it means normal to abnormal. You cannot be sure that this is a malignant tumor. Of course, this was a round cell tumor, no question about that. I'm showing this just to make that point. Be careful. Normal should be seen. Abnormal should be seen. And then you see the re, uh, bone of, uh, zone of transition and then talk about zone of transition. Okay, now look at this one. Okay, this old lady came with this pathological fracture and you see normal bone here. You see abnormal bone here. And it's very difficult to tell, for example, in this region, where normal begins and abnormal, it sort of merges. We call it permeative destructive lesion. That's a nice word to look uh, use when you want to sound intelligent, right? A permeative destructive lesion is something which goes in or flows in like water in all places, and you cannot tell where it stops and where it goes. It, it's like octopus going all over the place. Yeah. So this is a wide zone of transition, and most people will call this wide zone of transition. So once you know zone of transition is narrow or wide. For all practical purposes, you can say that this is benign, this is malignant, more appropriate, more, more technically right to say non-aggressive and aggressive lesion. Okay. So I'm making this a little confusing, uh, but I'm fine if you say this is benign and this is malignant. So this is a close-up of that, uh, which shows you that this is sort of a permeative destruction lesion. You start thinking that this is normal here. And then you see some some destruction here, so on and forth, forth and so forth. I mean, this is a layman's the white zone of transition. Now, this is a politician. You never know on which side he is. Sometimes here, sometimes there. Now, you have to be careful about these lesions. And these are interesting lesions. Now, for example, here at first sight, you would think that there is a na narrow zone of transition. And I would not hold it against you if you said that this is a narrow zone of transition. Interesting thing. This guy is expanding here, comes to the articular surface here, stops. Okay, that's just by the side. And you have this area. I can't tell for sure that this is a uh, narrow zone of transition. I mean, it, it's just habit. You looked at so many and you're not sure that this is a narrow zone of transition. But you did think that it's a narrow zone of transition. Uh, then really nothing wrong. But I'm looking at everything else. I'm looking at the rest of the skeleton. I, you know, sometimes you can look at a chest x-ray and say that this is an 80-year-old patient. You get that uh, sense of age from playing films uh, after so many years. So this is an old patient, and this lesion does not clearly look like a, uh, look like a uh, benign lesion. And then there's so much soft tissue swelling, and this is what I call as a aggressive lesion. That's a word that I learned from Bari. He uses it all the time. He wants to sound professional. Perhaps he is. So this is an aggressive lesion. You can call it locally malignant lesion. It may not have things outside, but this is a zonal transition like a politician somewhere in between. Sometimes here, sometimes there. You toss a coin and call it what you want. So once you have this zone of transition, your job is done. For all practical purposes, you've done your job. Go home, sleep happily ever after. Okay? That means you have said that this is a benign and a malignant tumor. You have made the differentiation. Your job is done as a radiologist, right? Because sometimes pathologists have this big problem in telling benign from malignant. I told you, they get a small piece of stuff, okay? Just a small piece of bark in mat, and you get it from coconut tree, you get it from palm tree, you get it from any damn tree, and you're supposed to tell what the tree is. So that's that problem. And not many of them specialize in bone tumors. So the next thing you look for, so the first job is done. Now you're getting more ambitious. You want to tell what exactly the tumor is, okay? How much time do I have? Okay, <clears throat> uh, for that, so we are following a flow chart. Age of the patient is important. Then whether there is a lesion or not, I mean, I'm sorry, once there's a lesion, you look at the age of the patient, you say whether it's benign or malignant, and then you start at the matrix. What is the matrix? That's the stuff that the tumor is made up of. So you can have, uh, black stuff like this. There is a destructive lesion. Keep looking at that tumor all the time. 
you are mentally going through this checklist immature skeleton narrow zone of transition and uh, immature because you can see that it's an epiphyseal lesion there and this stuff is black so in my reports i mentioned black matrix right it looks like laymanish but that's important when you have black black matrix it means there's a destructive lesion okay narrow zone of transition immature skeleton destructive lesion expansion etc etc on the other hand you can have something like this another politician neither black nor white as you will see this is a gray matrix a gray matrix is classical of fibrous or cartilaginous tumor okay more often fibrous and you see some big chunks of calcification here it's calcified cartilage okay that's very useful rarely do you see calcification in purely fibrous tumor so when you see this gray appearance is like a brushed up appearance patternless right no i'm not talking about those separations but between separations is beautiful pattern like stuff like mosaic tail this is gray and is classical of a fibrous or a cartilaginous tumor i repeat if there is calcification it's almost always a uh, cartilage and there is white stuff like this okay i took the more difficult example bone forming upper end of tibia okay i'm not talking benign or malignant i'm talking the second part that you look at you made benign or malignant you want to tell what further uh, differentiation you can make you look at that and the thing about white is important bone forming okay listen to me carefully when you talk a bone forming tumor it does not mean that it does not destroy bone you can have a whole lot of osteolysis in 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 the bone and then you see new bone formation a little bit here a little bit there it's a bone forming tumor a bone forming tumor is an x ray where you see new bone formation no matter what bone destruction is happening okay so that makes it a bone forming tumor but this is open and shut so this is a bone forming tumor so i have this i use the words okay black gray and white and teach say that there is a white tumor i mean bone forming tumor if you want to sound sophisticated so this is the second step so the next one and this is important the location of the tumor okay now we are used to saying middle third of the tumor right in in bone tumor that's not enough you are not talking of middle third proximal third or lot distal third because bone tumors either occur in epiphyseal metaphyseal or diaphyseal so having described the age of the patient having described the zone of transition having described the matrix you talk of a location if you want put location again okay anywhere what do you want so you can say there is a lesion in the proximal metaphyseal which is so much centimeter in diameter masala masala so location is important you talk of a location uh in terms of epiphysis metaphysis or diaphysis okay and if the mature skeleton there no real epiphysis you can say that in the region of the epiphysis or the head is usually the epiphysis that's something which is troubling me uh, how do you tell an epiphysial region in a mature skeleton okay so this one is completely open and shut close your eyes and i tell you a diagnosis immature skeleton expansion lesion black matrix in the diaphysis of the humerus on the right side 100% 100% is a simple bone cyst okay no exception if i tell you that there is a small piece of bone fallen inside you can see that here even god disagrees you can tell god go to hell this is a simple bone cyst with a fallen fragment sign so it sometimes no i won't say sometimes often okay what all that means easy to read a report to listen to a report and say or the pathological diagnosis is. so location is important and mature or immature skeleton is also important i am not making it sound easy it is easy 80% of the time it is like alphabet you can do it 20% of the time 10% of the time it's more difficult 10% of the time is googly you have no imagine such a thing in of your life and that happens to me often and on okay on and off go i get prefer difficult cases and i make mistakes often because the rules don't hold true okay so you go by what the pathology will say say okay maybe you are right but 80% of the time this is mathematics and it works now look at this region again location is important how do you tell the first thing that strikes me is that this is an immature skeleton you see non fused epiphysis so this is an expansion lesion black matrix in the distal metaphysis of the of the radius in an immature skeleton close your eyes and call it anusmal bone cyst and you will be right 98% of the time okay 
So what is aneurysmal bone cyst like this cannot be a simple bone cyst and cannot be a giant cell tumor. So this is another example, right? The only trouble, the difference between this fellow and this fellow is that this is more or less black and this is gray, okay? And I wonder if this is fibrocartilaginous and if it's fibrocartilaginous, though the location is not right, uh, this could be a chondrome exoid fibroma. So I, I, I am not sure, but I know this is benign. And I know that this is an ABC or chondrome exoid fibroma. This ABC fellow can do whatever it wants. It can come from anywhere. It can morph from any tumor into ABC, right? So, so I would call this chondrome exoid fibroma. I would be wrong because this is not a common location for chondrome exoid fibroma at the proximal end of the femur. So I would bet on unusable bone cysts. I had called this chondrome exoid fibroma because as per my rules, it was gray matrix. It turned out to be an unusable bone cyst. So you can make mistakes off and on. And sometimes location is more important than all the rules that I'm making here. Now, look at this fellow. Right. Now, this guy versus this guy. This is an immature skeleton. Okay. And this is a mature skeleton. Big difference. I would never, ever call this an unusable bone cyst. If the pathologist call this animal bone cells, I keep doing this all the time. I tell them, go jump in a lake. Sometimes I go jump in a Arabian Sea. This cannot be an animal bone cell. So this is a mature skeleton. It is subarticular. It goes all the way up to the articular surface. And this is a big osteolytic lesion, black stuff, narrow zone of transition, almost always. 99.9, sorry, 99.5% of the time, this is a giant cell tumor. What am I saying? I am saying that looking at the maturity or the immaturity of the skeleton, looking at the location of the lesion, once you have a benign tumor, you can say with great confidence whether it is a chondrome exoid fibroma, aneurysmal bone cyst, simple bone cyst, or a giant cell tumor, right? Uh, you may not remember all the rules that I'm talking about. You can look up books. The point I'm making in this lecture is the flow chart that you need to have to be able to come to a reasonable radiological diagnosis. Sometimes, pathological diagnosis. Let me quickly go through these, right? This guy is in the metaphysis, can never be a giant cell tumor. This guy is in the metaphysis, can never be a giant cell tumor. He, both of these could have been aneurysmal bone cysts or perhaps this one, chondrome exoid fibroma. And this can be nothing except giant cell tumor because this is a mature skeleton. Sorry, this is a, a benign tumor. This is a mature skeleton. This guy is subarticular. It has to be a giant cell tumor. Okay, so these are uh, ways of telling benign tumor. Now, <clears throat> I learned this late in life that you have a lesion like this, which is subarticular, and you know that this is giant cell tumor, open and shut, first year resident stuff. But you have a lesion like that, and you look at it carefully, the right femur, I'm talking to you about the uh, osteolytic lesion, which is in the neck and the proximal metaphysis of the region of the metaphysis. Now, this guy is a mature skeleton. Look at it carefully. This is a mature skeleton. So I said, this is a mature skeleton. It seems to be going up to the articular surface here, up to there. I'm sorry, here. And how can it be a giant cell tumor? So I call this aneurysmal bone cyst. And the pathology, and we had a lot of discussion before, this is pre-MR era, we had a lot of discussion and the pathologist said, Ravi, you jump in a lake, but this came also. You jump in a lake, this is not an unusual bone cyst. I sort of thought about this, I read about this, and this is what happens. Now, we talked about tumors which are subarticular. Giant cell tumors can do this if they arise from a region of the apophysis which has fused, okay? So for all practical purposes, there was articular there was cartilage there, that cartilage fused, and a tumor has arisen from the apophysis of the greater trochanter here. So this is a giant cell tumor, which is related to an apophysis, not related to an epiphysis. So this is a zebra, don't forget, don't remember, but just making the point that you can slip, uh, rules can break, but rules don't break actually, you have to understand the rules better, okay? It's like law. There can be a lot of spa, small print. So this is the exception to the rule that all giant cell tumors are subarticular. Some of them can arise from the apophysis and still be giant cell tumors. Move on. <clears throat> Let's skip this one. Okay, we talked about this. Okay, 
Now this is uh, a simple one. Sometimes you look at the location, you look at the morphology, and you know that this is what it is. So this is a narrow zone of transition. It has got gray matrix. You probably see chunks of calcification. It arises from the metatarsal or metacarpal, and it has been there for 100 years because it is excavating the adjacent uh, bone here. So this is a benign tumor, which is expansile, circular, gray matrix, chunks of calcification from the metatarsal or a metacarpal. Close your eyes and call it an encounter. Okay. You can call it egg chondroma. I always call this an enchondroma because this guy is expansive. It goes up to the articular surface, stops the uh, mature skeleton. So this has been there for a very long time. This is useful, right? Extremely useful. Even the zone, now even this guy becomes a chondrosarcoma, which it does sometimes. If you see this one, you know that it has been there for a long time. Okay. Google calls it beginning of time, very, very long time. Okay, now this is this is how you go mathematically. And uh, just a, a psychologist who uh, did this by saying that human brain looks at something and it doesn't look at analysis. You no, know, you don't look at everybody's face and just eyes are like this, this like radiologists talk. By the way, has it ever happened to any of you that you have great memory for images, right? And poor memory for faces. I have that all the time. If I've seen an X-ray, CT, MR for 10 seconds, you show me that five years later, I can tell that I have seen this before. I, I talk to a human being for half an hour. I see him in the corridor. I have not seen him at all. So this is something I want to uh, look at. I mean, I've been bothering about this because it's so fascinating. You can't remember faces, but you can remember X-rays. And one of the reasons I feel is that when you're looking at an X-ray or image, you're describing it. You're actually describing it. When you look at a human being, you look. You don't look at how the eyes are, etc., etc. That just starts. You look at something and you know that this is something and sometimes that happens in radiology okay uh now we call it spot diagnosis and modern day they call it spotters okay if i hear the word spotters my blood boils literally boils it's bad english a spotter is a person who spots okay the whole word is going spotter 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 god say it's not spotter it's spot you are the spotter okay Okay, so I wrote a dirty letter to the Indian Journal of Radiology who wanted to call one of my articles a spotter. I told them I withdraw the article. You call it spots or don't call it anything. Okay, so this is just start, uh, which you call spot diagnosis. You see it once, <laughs> Aunt Penny Radiology. Now, I will not get into that. I would like to spend some five minutes on why it's called Aunt Penny. Many of us know Aunt Penny. You've seen a donkey before. You see a donkey again, you'll call it a donkey. You would not call it a goat or a horse or whatever, right? A donkey looks like a donkey. You can't explain it. You don't need to explain it. So this is what is called as heart pain radiology and sometimes it's useful in bone tumors. So you see something like this, okay? And this is gray matrix. And this is what is called as ground glass up here. And some radiologists sometimes use the word ground glass and this is ground glass, okay? What is ground glass? This is ground glass. Get that into your temporal lobes, okay? And when you see ground glass, when you want to use the word ground glass to describe a lesion, it is almost always synonymous with fibrous dysplasia. So this guy is fibrous dysplasia. This one here in the middle third of the uh, of the tibia. Now you see, I'm bypassing the other roots, right? I'm not looking at age. I'm not looking at location. I'm looking at the actual lesion. I'm calling it what it is. So this is because these uh, these appearances are so uh, characteristic that you can sort of bypass the other roots, right? You don't have to describe eyes, feet, toe, tail, etc. And I give this example because it, it's so interesting that how human beings function outside in real life can be applied to radiology, right? Uh, like, for example, those who are not seeing me, now you see me, next time you see me, you'll call me Ravi, hopefully, right? Not because I have this, 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 but because you've seen me and somebody has told you that this is Ravi. Okay, so this is another one. Classical fibrous dysplasia lower half of the tibia. Now, this is interesting. People make mistakes of this. You see an unusual dot, an unusual line here. You see that? And then you see a small hole here. This is an osteochondroma, which is seen on end. Because that guy is going front or backward, and you're seeing the root of the osteochondroma. So if you see something like this in an immature skeleton, don't miss it. In fact, you can see that the proximal metaphysis is a little dysplastic. So this is a patient with diaphyseal ecclesia, and you see one osteochondroma, and this is just out. Often will be missed. 
But remember, you see a line like this in the metaphysis of an immature skeleton, you are going to do the opposite view and make sure that there's an osteochondroma. Better still, see the patient, feel, and the patient will tell you, I got a swelling here. I mean, sometimes I wonder why you waste so much time in radiology when the patient can be asked. The patient will tell you that I have got a swelling there and life is so much easier. Okay. Now, this is another answer, right? Uh, there's a patient who had, uh, what do you think this would have been? That bone cement inside the femur. So this is going up to the articular surface. Very likely it was a uh, giant cell tumor. We are looking to find the old x-rays. The patient has disappeared in the lockdown. There's an active case. But you see this big lesion, which is a so bubble like up here. As so bubble as so bubble can get. Okay. Sometimes it looks like a hydrated. So this is a classical giant cell. I'm sorry, classical aneurysmal bone cyst. I told you an aneurysmal bone cyst is like a politician. It can be on this side of the table, one side, on this side, below the other side. It can occur from anywhere, from any other tumor, virtually. And this one was an aneurysmal bone cyst, which occurred from the region of surgery of a patient who had a giant cell tumor. So this is so bubble for you, right? You see it once, you see it again, this is ABC. The pathologist will call it ABC. You say, I agree for a change. So this is a uh, bone destructive lesion. Now you have new bone formation. I told you first thing, new bone formation does not mean that the old bone is destroyed. Okay, so you're looking at white stuff on plain films. So this is open and shut. A lot of bone destruction, but a whole lot of new bone formation. You see something like this, it's long standing, there's dislocation of the elbow, there is a whole lot of uh, abnormal anatomy here, but you see new bone formation with chunks of calcification like this, for all practical purposes, this is a chondrosarcoma, okay? Now you can't really define the zone of transition here, that's a big problem. But if you do multiple images, and if you look at CT, zone of transition becomes more difficult. So here what you look at is that this lesion looks malignant. You may have old films where it has been growing, but for all practical purposes, this is a bone forming new tumor in the diametaphysis. And AB, I'm sorry, uh, uh, osteogenic sarcoma doesn't grow like this. It grows into the region of the metaphysis in a mostly an immature skeleton. So this is a bone forming tumor, which is likely to be malignant. The reason I'm showing this is to tell you what it means by bone forming. Can destroy a whole lot of bone, but it forms new bone. This is another example, bone forming tumor. This one was a classical osteochondroma, something like that. End on thing I showed you in the proximal humerus. Once upon a time, this guy was a nice fellow like that. Growing, 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 a lot of calcification in cartilage. This is an osteochondroma with calcification. On this one view, you can't tell whether it's benign or malignant. In fact, chondrosarcomas are something which is extremely difficult to diagnose on plane. Very difficult to tell whether it's a chondroma or a chondrosarcoma. You have to depend upon the pathology. Don't fight with the pathology about this one, right? You can't tell on clean tones what's going on. This is another example of bone forming tumor. This again is a chondrosarcoma arising from an osteochondroma. You can actually see new bone formation far away from the main tumor. And there are ways to tell, ways to guess, in fact, whether this is a benign or a malignant chondroid tumor. But this is another example of bone forming. You see the amount of bone destruction here. This is all black stuff. But the, this is white stuff. Even a bit of white stuff is enough to tell you that this is a bone forming tumor. This is tricky, okay? So you have a little bit of ossification here. And this is a classical location, absolutely classical. The medial cortex of the proximal femur. Now, if you have a bone forming tumor inside the capsule, which is mainly of a joint, which is mainly therefore synovial membrane, you will not see as much new bone formation. You may just see osteolytic lesion like you see in an osteoid osteoma. Intra-articular osteoid osteoma do not produce classical new bone formation. This is a classic location, absolutely classic. And you ask the patient, will be a young boy. This one was older patient. Uh, I think he was 17 or 18, somewhere, somewhere there. And they will have classical features. Severe pain will be limping and they probably will have night pains uh, really with aspirin. But the point I want to make here, you see sclerosis like this, not very dense, like you're used to seeing in osteo osteoma. If it is an intra-articular location, don't be surprised. New bone formation does not occur as much in an intra-articular location. Homework, why? Why does it not occur in an intra-articular intra -articular location? 
This is another bone forming tumor and bone forming tumors can be multiple in the spine, open and short. This is metastasis from prostate, right? In an exam, you might be asked why is it not fluorosis, but this one or bone forming. You can see a lot of bone destruction here. Believe me, it is real, but there is new bone formation. So you would call it bone forming uh, lesion. Now, so we quickly run through all of this. And I, I call this, when I talk to a resident, I say, uh, the way I teach is the national anthem. Don't change anything. Follow the rules. God has spoken. Okay. How pompous can you get? Follow those rules till you make your own rules, which are better than the rules that I teach. So I call this the national anthem. Let's quickly run through that as a part of revision. So we talk of age of the patient, mature or immature skeleton. And then we talked about epiphyseal, metaphyseal, diaphyseal, giant cell tumor versus aneurysmal bones, zone of transition, benign was a met, uh, malignant, matrix is what tells you gray, white, or black, and multiplicity is what tells you about this, for example, diaphyseal ecclesia or not. So this is in short what we go through in deciding about bone tumors. I finished on time. Samir, I'm done. Thank you very much, sir. It was nice uh, listening to you time and again, as always. Uh, it still creates a lot of uh, clarity on the thought process. Uh, I have one question which has been posted by somebody. Uh, it's uh, You said, sir, that the gray matrix is formed by the fibrocartilaginous tissue. What does What is the black matrix made up of? Black matrix are usually cysts. For example, unusual bones, fluid. I mean, just fluid, right? not tissue, uh, for example, giant cell tumor or a simple bone cell. It can get tricky sometimes, right? It's extremely subjective. So when you look at black stuff on MR, know that it's cartilage, for example, and sometimes you correlate with plain films, correlate with MR. So when I say black stuff, I mean simple bone cells, aneurysmal bone cells, or a giant cell tumor. When I say gray, I mean fibrocartilaginous tumor. It can be an enchondroma, it can be fibro it can be a chondromic fibroma, it can be fibrous dysplasia, whatever in that category. So it's a whole lot of eyeballing that happens. You constantly com compensate for exposure. Um, I mean, if you're uninitiated in this, you'd ask me, how do you tell? But it's possible. In a few years, you'll be able to tell whether it is black matrix or whether it is gray matrix. OK, so thank you very much. Another question is, please explain about the bone infarct. Where did bone infarct come in bone tumors? Anyway, so one point I wanted to make here is before I forget is that I usually don't pay much attention to periosteal reaction. You read textbook, they will talk of benign and malignant periosteal reaction, which is true, but I usually don't follow that pattern of argument because I look at the zone of transition. And the other thing is about fractures. Cortical break, okay? Any tumor, any bone tumor can break cortex. It has nothing, whatever to do with benign or malignant. Cortical break, therefore it's malignant. You wrong, you're wrong as wrong can get. Okay, so don't pay too much attention to cortical breaks. And periosteal reaction, it depends on your teacher. It depends on your own learning. Uh, you could say that malignant and benign is useful about periosteal reaction. Different books have different ways of looking at bone tumors. This is my way of look, looking at bone tumors, which I feel is fairly simple and very often right. Okay, uh, what are the questions I may see, I keep talking. Uh, so please explain about bone infarct. Okay, bone infarct is a different thing altogether. Now, bone infarct is an extremely, extremely subjective impression. For example, classically in, uh, in Perthes disease or in adults with bone infarct, uh, I'm not talking about medullary infarct. That's a different ball game altogether. That is a geographic location, most often in the proximal end of the humerus in old people. Uh, bone infarct, for all practical purposes, the white stuff in the head of the female. It's on plain films, you will see sclerosis. And this is, again, extremely, extremely uh, uh, subjective. For example, if I see an open and shut bone infarct, for example, there is sclerosis, there is flattening, there are SWA changes. On the left side, I don't look at it. I look at the opposite side. Because in about 20, 30% of the time, it's bilateral. I look at the opposite side, and I say that there is bone infarct on the opposite side. And my junior consultant says, sir, you can say anything. When I say it's on the opposite side, I'm right at least 70, 80 percent of the time on MR. So that's again extremely subjective. The open and shut bone infarct is classical 
sclerosis, the five grades of uh, classification about whether surgery and what surgery is to be done. But the subtle one is subtle increased density. So the answer to your question is bone infarct is increased density in the right place. Okay, mostly proximal end of the femur. I think that is what he wanted to know because many times it may look like a, some kind of a bone tumor at an initial phase. Later on, it may not look like that. Mm -hmm. Another codement strangle. Yeah, uh, that's can what you... I told you. You talked about periosteal reaction. Of... You talked about periosteal reaction. Uh, uh, and classically, in osteogenic sarcoma, you get codement strangle. Codement strangle, you start looking at the rapid growth of bone. So when there is rapid growth of non-ossified bone, the periosteum lifts and you so don't see the calcified tumor. So whenever there is rapid growth of bone, the periosteum gets elevated and you see a cardman triangle. What you should be looking at actually is a non-ossified matrix of an osteogenic sarcoma, which is useful and it, it is a phenomenon that is related to rapid growth of tumor when it is not ossified. And that, that's very interesting. When you want to look as osteochondroma becoming chondrosarcoma and the radiologic sign, and why it happens, it's so very interesting. Somewhere in 2045, you give me one hour and talk about that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, another one. So let me answer. Cartman's triangle it means a rapidly growing malignant tumor. Rapidly growing tumor, therefore malignant. Okay. Right, sir. I think uh, what the listeners need to understand is we were not discussing about the uh, individual tumor it was basically how we approach a suspected case of a tumor uh, yeah, am right. i right sir so i i send them look at periosteal reaction in the sense that you talk about not talk about cardinal triangle in the exam you probably will fail so you should yeah. mention those things if you feel like uh, but i think that's not a big deal that's just an incidental finding of a rapidly growing tumor like you have laminated periosteal reaction aggressive periosteal reaction solid periosteal reaction they also ran. The main race, according to me, is in these points. Probably, sir, our, many of our uh, listeners right now are students. So they might be uh, interested in look at the particular signs like Cordman's triangle yeah, or laminar. Le yeah. A dirty examiner, they say, what is the nonsense? You're not talking about Cordman's triangle. Yeah. So uh, like uh, onion peel tumors or like... Yeah, all that. Right. Use right. Nice, tomato peel, onion peel, sandwich sign, do what you want. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, another question is aggressive osteomyelitis with destruction. How to differentiate from malignancy? Okay, the first thing about aggressive osteomyelitis for urine sarcoma is impossible. Virtually impossible to diagnose. On, on clinical exam, for example, it, it looks aggressive. It's a reddish uh, limb, very painful. Sedimentation rates are high and it's all leukocytosis and you wonder what is going on. You think it's infection. Right on plain films, it looks like multiple layers of periosteal reaction. There's some bone destruction. You can't tell what's going on. For example, Ewing's is a classical example of this. The point with Ewing's is that it's five to fifteen years of age. It is a bang in the diaphysis, and the damn thing is huge mass. It may have a metastasis. So the whole thing is circumstantial. If you ask me one question: Chronic osteomyelitis with bone tumors is no runner. There is no comparison. It's easy. Okay. When you have layers of periosteal reaction in chronic osteomyelitis, you don't get massive bone, uh, new bone, I'm sorry, massive soft tissue swelling. The real trouble is when you have aggressive osteomyelitis in a child who is 5 to 15 years of age, and then you want to differentiate it between uh, from Ewing sarcoma. According to me, the one way is that Ewing sarcoma is associated with massive soft tissue swelling, which is not as common in periosteal, I'm sorry, in acute osteomyelitis. It's, it's an important differential diagnosis. By and large, you can tell that both looking at the patient and <clears throat> looking at plain films. Okay, sir. Uh, can you just repeat the name of the book, sir, which you had mentioned okay. earlier about? Uh, I will do that. I told you I get 10% on that. Um, it's Fundamentals of Skeletal Radiology by Clyde C-L-Y-E-E. -E. Helms, H E L M S. It's available on Amazon or maybe on Flipkart. Okay. Buy the paperback version. Read it from skin to skin. Okay. It's so, can you share the. Sorry. Uh, you go ahead, sir. I'm so sorry. 
Sorry, I said Amazon, no, also Flipkart. Yeah. I get commission from okay. them also. Oh. Yeah. So will you be ready to share that part of that commission to MSBRA, sir? Why should I do that? Come on. Okay. Please tell difference between periosteal thickening and cortical thickening. When the periosteum thickens, you call it periosteal thickening. When the cortex thickens, you call it cortical thickening. Now, these uh, are things which are something that you see, okay? Uh, cortical thickening will have trabecular patterns, whereas periosteal reaction will have laminated appearance. Um, by and large, it's possible to tell. Sometimes you can't tell. You simply say it looks like periosteal reaction. So these are gray areas, okay? You show me 10, I'll make mistakes in five. Okay. I'm more likely to be half, 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 half. But the technical difference is when you see cortical pattern in a bone, it is cortical thickening. And when you see, don't see it, periosteal reaction. You look at the big picture, what else is going on, right? If you have hyperparathyroidism and you have black, black bone, post trabecular pattern and layers of periosteum, you'll call it periosteal reaction. You'll not call it uh, cortical thickening, okay? So it's one part is the whole picture, big picture. And not always easy. You can make mistakes. I make mistakes. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think that ends our questions because I've got these many uh, questions only. Uh, we'll be having another lecture by sir next Sunday uh, at the same time. Sir, we have given you uh, means uh, uh, as much time as you wish. So, so you can uh, are not restricted by the time frame, sir. Yeah, so whatever exactly. you wish to do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll like to hear as much as possible from you. Uh, next week, we will again have sir on Saturday. Also, we have another session. So thank you, everyone, sir. And what sir, thank you very much. Week? What are you saying? I'll get a fit. Sorry, sir. I'm talking next week, you said, no, on Sunday. Yeah, of course, sir. Next Sunday, okay. you are uh, talking on the uh, like your pulse of wisdom on radiology practice. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, which I think it's my personal uh, very uh, preference, sir, that I always like to listen to you on that. So, and if possible, we'd like to have one session on skeletal dysplasia also, sir. Okay, the week after that, no? Yeah, sure, definitely, sir. Okay, sure. Thank you very much, sir. So okay, nice bye. Bye-bye, sir. sir. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, it's very nice of sir to give us such a nice lecture to us sir. thank you very much have a good day and stay safe